There exists some fundamental truths in society today. First, there will always be students knocking on my door asking for extra credit, which I don't give. Second, there's always some grumpy professor who won't give extra credit in your courses. Third, and more relevant to the talk here, is that human energy consumption is continuing to increase. While we will always desire more for less, we need to ask ourselves if now is the time to adopt renewable energy technologies that will lessen the impact on our climate. Can we develop these technologies at costs that are competitive with conventional fuel sources? I believe that now is the time. But first we need to look at some numbers. 104 trillion kilowatt hours. This is the current yearly world energy consumption. In a more Oklahoma-centric viewpoint, this is the same energy content as 9 million tons of oil. I don't know what 9 million tons of oil looks like, so I'm going to reframe this number in something I do understand. Microwaves. So almost all of us in here own a microwave oven. And your microwave oven, when you use it, uses about 1,000 watts of power, or one kilowatt of power. If you ran that microwave for one hour, that's one kilowatt hour. If you ran that same microwave for 24 hours a day, for 365 days a year, that's 9,000 kilowatt hours. So if we used all of our energy to run microwaves, we would need 12 billion microwave ovens running 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's a lot of hot pockets. <laughs> Luckily for us, there is a huge renewable energy source in the form of the sun. Now in one year, the amount of solar energy that strikes the surface of the earth is over 10,000 times our world yearly energy demand. Unfortunately, comparing these two numbers by, side by side is a little bit unfair for a couple of reasons. First, our energy com consumption comes from a wide variety of sources. We use coal, natural gas, oil, nuclear, a little bit of wind and solar, we burn wood, we burn manure, and other things. Second, the way we consume our energy is wildly different. We heat, we cool, we charge iPhones, we drive. Uh, we also use them, use energy in uh, industrial processes, such as the frosty beverage I'm going to have when this talk is over. Third, and most important to solar energy, is that yearly number I talked about was for the whole year and the whole surface of the Earth. So you can imagine that there's times of days and regions in the world where the sun shines greatly, but there's nobody there to use it. Conversely, there's parts of the world that have a high demand for energy, but where there's very little solar resource. This adds to the cost and complexity of developing solar energy technologies. That being said, we can still evaluate some of these things. Shown here is a map of the solar resource for the United States. Darker regions represent areas where you have a better solar resource. So for Oklahoma, let's consider what we can do. <clears throat> we currently use about 500 billion kilowatt hours of energy in Oklahoma per year. If we wanted to meet that demand with photovoltaic panels with a modest efficiency of 10%, more to come on those a little bit later, we would need an area of 1,000 square miles to meet our yearly demand. While that sounds like a really big number, that's only one-fifth of the Oklahoma panhandle. Additionally, you can see in this map that states like Arizona and New Mexico have a much better solar resource than Oklahoma, but that shouldn't discourage us. You see, we have a solar resource that's 50% better than Germany, and they've been able to adopt solar energy so much that 7% of their total electric demand is coming from that resource. Photovoltaic, or PV panels, as shown here, are one of the fastest growing and lowest cost sources of renewable energy currently on the market. Advanced manufacturing and large scales of production in China have led to costs that are com competitive with conventional fuel sources such as coal in this country. This has led to widespread adoption in states and countries like California and Germany, where adding more and more PV to the grid causes some unique problems. It's also the reason why I'm wearing this tie. You see, my solar tie was actually designed 
by a world-renowned scientist and the first ever PV researcher hired on as staff at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. PV materials work by directly converting incoming solar energy into electricity. Shown here is a prism, and the reason why I'm showing this is to illustrate something that happens within photovoltaic cells or PV cells. As light comes in, or solar energy, which is primarily white light, comes into this prism, it's divided up into a bunch of colors that you and I can see. Unfortunately, a PV material can only work with a limited number of these colors or a limited number of the spectrum. This leads to some challenges in adoption. Additionally, all solar energy technologies have a problem with when the sun isn't shining or basically from a cloud or from late afternoon or even at night. This is particularly problematic for PV because the cost of storing electricity with a battery is so cost prohibitive at a large scale that we can't integrate this into our utility grid. This has led to particularly difficult challenges to overcome when we see lots and lots and lots of adoption of PV onto the grid because as the sun goes down in the afternoon and PV stops producing, you have to ramp your grid back up to meet the demand from you and I that is very, very high in the afternoon. Fortunately, there is a solution for solar energy with storage. So shown here is what's called a concentrating parabolic or a concentrating solar thermal plant. This works by taking incoming solar energy and focusing it with mirrors, so you see these mirror-like troughs, onto a receiver that heats up to high temperatures. We take heat out of that high temperature receiver and we can store it in a tank. And that tank has very good insulation and up to 10 hours later we could recover that energy and then turn it into electricity if we want. Unfortunately, these systems have a problem and that is their cost. So shown here is a concentrating solar power tower. Similar idea as concentrating solar thermal trough but we use a bunch of mirrors that surround this tower. Some of these mirrors can be up to two and a half miles away from the top of this tower. And that's all just to create heat. We still have to have all of the associated equipment needed to turn that heat into electricity. We can go through the same exercise we did with photovoltaics for concentrating solar thermal. So this map, although still a map of the US, is slightly different. And that's because it's focused on the concentrating solar resource. So in order for us to concentrate solar energy, we have to be able to see the sun directly. This is similar to what happens if you try and go out on a very sunny day and burn an ant or a leaf with a magnifying glass. That works. If you go out on a slightly cloudy day, it won't work. So going through the same exercise with a concentrating solar thermal power plant with about a 25% efficiency, we only need about 400 square miles. So we can see from both of these systems that they have advantages and disadvantages. PV is low cost, but it only uses a portion of the spectrum, and it's too expensive to store on a wide scale level. Concentrating solar thermal, on the other hand, uses the full spectrum. It's easily stored in the form of thermal energy, but the cost of generating electricity is about two to three times more expensive. So what if we could take the best of both approaches, meld them together, and come up with a better technology? That's the idea here, which is called a hybrid solar thermal collector. The idea is still to concentrate light, and then it comes into some component. This mythical component I have drawn up here is called a spectrum splitter. It's somewhat similar to the, uh, the prism I showed earlier. So the idea here is you separate the light into two distinct groups. One group goes to the left here, to the photovoltaic cell, that can efficiently turn its narrow spectrum of light into electricity. The rest goes to the thermal collector where it's turned into heat. This is actually a $31 million initiative by the federal government to try and develop this technology for, further. One of these awards is called PV Mirror, and it focuses on integrating the photovoltaic cell into the parabolic trough itself. The idea here is that once sun comes in and strikes that, that mirror and the PV cell, that it will turn a narrow portion of it directly into electricity at a highly efficient rate. The rest will be reflected back to the typical concentrating solar thermal component. 
While the University of Tulsa isn't normally considered a solar powerhouse, we did manage to win one of these awards. Shown here is the prototype collector that we're going to do our demonstrations on at the North Campus. The backbone of our technology, though, is a little bit different. Our goal is to get rid of that spectrum splitter and do the absorption of thermal energy directly into a working fluid. So what we do is we take these tubes here on a much bigger scale and directly absorb the wavelengths or the colors that the photovoltaic can't use into a specially designed fluid. The rest of the light then gets passed through to the photovoltaic cell where it can be efficiently turned into electricity. We hope that this project, as well as the others, will enable low-cost solar energy that can be easily stored and used later. By developing our technology right here in Oklahoma, we hope to transform our energy economy. And at the end of the day, we need to ask ourselves if we are ready to adopt renewable energy technologies. Now is the time. Thank you.